Thank you for joining us in today's webinar on computational thinking and coding. My name is Stephanie Halatic, and I'm currently a PhD candidate at the Workland School of Education. My research focuses on new and exciting ways to teach coding, especially to people who haven't done a lot of coding before. And my name is Karen Sandu, an education specialist with MindFuel, and we're excited to bring some of these computational thinking concepts and ideas to you in today's webinar. Let's start by looking at technology. Technology is made up of two components, the hardware and the software. The hardware is anything that you would be able to physically touch. This includes the motherboard and other circuit boards and their components, the screen, the keyboard, and the mouse. The software is the digital computer code that exists in the memory of the computer. Software can take many forms, an operating system such as Windows, programs such as Microsoft Word or Google Chrome, computer games, or other applications. Coding, or programming, involves writing this software, and this uses computational thinking. So if you look up the meaning of computational thinking, you'll find many different perspectives and definitions that come up. We've shared one definition with you on the slide um, here, which essentially states that computational thinking involves formulating problems and their solutions in a way that enables us to use computers to help work through them. One important element to understand is that computational thinking is an approach to problem solving. So it can be compared to other problem solving methods like the scientific method or design thinking. Each is useful for its own purpose. Uh, scientific method, we are looking at discovering something new when we create a hypothesis and designing an experiment around that to test the hypothesis and draw conclusions from an experiment. Um, design thinking is when we're trying to innovate and ideate new solutions to problems. And computational thinking is when we're breaking down that problem so that we can leverage computers specifically to help us solve those problems or similar problems. So it's a framework to describe a set of critical thinking and problem solving skills. So computational thinking involves various steps and we've listed some of them here. The first is decomposition. That is taking the complex problem and breaking it down into smaller, more manageable parts. This step will often involve gathering and organizing data as well. Pattern recognition is exactly that observing patterns and trends in the data set. This step can allow us to consider how similar problems have been solved previously. Abstraction is focusing in on the details that matter and ignoring the rest. So this step involves generalizing uh, as opposed to looking at specifics, which will then help us come up with our last step, algorithmic design. This involves coming up with simple steps or rules which will ultimately lead to a solution. The logical step-by-step -step procedures and instructions is how we can then utilize computers to solve a problem. And it's important to remember that after you've created your algorithm, you will need to test and debug it for errors. So these steps will become more obvious as we work through some examples of computational thinking together. So it is evident that we live in a digital world and this will be even more pre prevalent in the coming years. Phones have already become our personal companions and assistants. As educators, we need our students to move beyond just the consumption of technology and into creation and problem solving. There's also the fact that more and more jobs are requiring the skill set that computational thinking encompasses. So it's also important to remember that computational thinking is not only for those who wish to become computer scientists or computer engineers. The skills involved in computational thinking are broad ranging and they allow our students to feel more capable of tackling open-ended and complex problems and practice their 21st century skills like critical thinking, problem solving, and communication. According to Brennan and Resnick, there are seven main computational thinking concepts. The first is sequences, or a series of steps or instructions that are executed in order, one after another. We can also see loops, which are used for running the same step or group of steps over and over until a condition is met. Parallelism, 
is when multiple things are executing at the same time simultaneously. Events is when one thing happens that causes something else to happen. We might also see conditional statements or decision statements. If something happens, then something will happen. Else, something different will happen. There's also operators, such as mathematical operations, including addition, subtraction, multiplication, division, trigonometry, and exponents. Logical operators, such as or, and, or not. And operators that work on strings, which are a set of characters and letters, such as finding the length of a string or concatenating two strings together. Finally, computational thinking involves data, storing, retrieving, and updating values. We actually use many of these computational thinking concepts every day. We're just not aware of it. For example, think about getting dressed in the morning. There's a sequence to the clothes that you put on. First your shirt, then your jacket. First your socks, then your shoes. The order really matters. You're also making decisions about what to wear, just like using a conditional statement in code. If it is raining outside, then I will wear my rain boots. Else, or otherwise, I'll just wear my runners. Or, if it is cold, then I will wear my winter jacket. Else, I'll just wear my hoodie. We also use computational thinking in cooking. Recipes always have a sequence of steps that have to be done in a particular order. First, you chop the vegetables, then you add garlic to the pan, then you add the vegetables into the pan, and then you cook them. You can also make decisions, which is like using a conditional statement. If the pasta is soft, then I need to turn off the heat and get it out of the water. If I want my chili to be super spicy, then I need to add more hot sauce. Cooking may also have operators. If you want to double a recipe, you need to multiply all of the ingredient amounts by two. From these examples, we can see that we are actually using computational thinking every day. We just don't realize it. Breaking down our everyday activities in terms of the computational thinking concepts can give us a better understanding of what exactly these concepts are and how we might program a robot to carry out these activities. What other computational thinking activities in your daily life can you think of? Brennan and Resnick also identified different computational thinking practices or things that coders and programmers do when they are solving computational problems. Being incremental and iterative involves working step by step, building and imagining. When we want to write a program, we shouldn't just write the entire thing and then test it. It's much easier to write a successful program if we do it in small steps. First, write one part of the code and make sure that works. Once it's working, add on to it. We might also imagine new ways of doing things along the way and go back and change our code. Another practice involves testing and debugging, running parts of our code to see if they work, and if they don't, carefully combing through the code and tweaking it until we can get rid of the error or the bug. Computational thinkers also reuse and remix code that others have written. Unless the code is intellectual property, Coders will often look up what lines of code are needed to do something in particular, such as turn on an LED, and then copy that into their code, tweaking it a little until it works for their purposes. Open source code is code that the authors have put up online for free for anyone to reuse and remix however they would like. Finally, computational thinkers use abstracting to move from a concrete individual set of steps and turn it into a pattern or an algorithm. They also modularize, breaking a large program into smaller chunks that each have their own purposes, and those chunks can be more easily written and tested on their own before combining them back together. Finally, Brennan and Resnick identified three perspectives used in computational thinking. Computational thinking can be used to express ourselves in different ways through different media. It can also help us to share our work with others and connect in new ways to people both online and offline. Finally, computational thinking can prompt us to ask questions about the digital world and our place within it. Did you know? Dancing is just like coding. 
Dances have steps in a particular order or a sequence. Steps might repeat themselves, like in a loop. A certain event may start the dance, such as the music starting or the chorus starting. And you may even have to make decisions while dancing. If there's no space to keep moving to the left, you might have to turn or move in a different direction. Let's look at an example. So at this point, we're going to play a clip of a simple dance sequence. And while you're watching, uh, we want, to want you to identify the computational thinking concepts that you see. Okay, so at this point, we'd like for you to go ahead and pause the webinar and go back and watch this dance again as many times as you need to so that you can write out the step-by-step -step instructions that the dancers are following. Some tools that might help you in this activity are identifying the sequence or order of steps, looking for patterns, and paying attention to how specific you're being when writing out your steps. Imagine that you'll be sharing your steps with someone else so that they can recreate the dance. Here you can see the code that we've come up with to describe the dance that we did. As you can see, the code for even a short dance can be very complicated. We have done our best to be very specific in our descriptions of our dance moves, but you may disagree with how we have worded them. Feel free to use your own language or add in any details that you think are lacking. One of the challenges with coding is that we must be very precise. It may feel like we're over explaining, but really what we're doing is making it crystal clear what the computer, or in this case the dancer, needs to do. Humans are really good at filling in the blanks when something is missing or unclear, but computers are not. To write this code, we paid attention to the sequence of the dance moves and looked for patterns, which ended up turning into loops. We also went back and forth between the video and the code in an iterative fashion to ensure that the code matched exactly what the dance looked like. So this activity around computational thinking and dance can be a quick and easy way to introduce this concept into your classroom with your students. So you can easily get your students to come up with a short dance of about 30 seconds to one minute and then have them write instructions for their dance or code and test these instructions with another group. They'll most likely have to go back and modify their instructions or code um, if they weren't specific enough or if something was missing. It's also a great way to get your students up and moving. Flowcharts are a good tool to represent a thinking process, such as an algorithm or sequence of events or actions, in a graphical format. They can also be used to help students think and reflect on their thinking process. The National Reading Panel also cited that the use of graphic organizers, such as flowcharts, as being one of the seven most effective instructional strategies for improving reading comprehension. So on the slide, we've shared a very simple flowchart. So let's walk through it together. At the top, we have our start. Moving down, we have a parallelogram, which represents an input in this case, which would be the name of an animal. Moving along, we have a triangle, which is going to represent a condition or decision-making process. In this case, it's figuring out, does that animal eat only plants? From there, we have two options. If the answer is no, the computer will print carnivore, that's an output. If the answer is yes, the computer prints herbivore. And that brings us to the end of the flowchart. So as you're looking at this flowchart, we do see that there is an improvement that could be made. One thing to remember when you're testing a flowchart is that regardless of what the input is, we should be reaching an output that makes sense to answer the problem. So let's look at the example of a bear. So if the input is a bear and the question asks, does it eat only plants? We know the answer is no. In this case, the flowchart will print carnivore. However, that's not true. We know bears are actually omnivores. 
So we should have another decision or option pre present in this flowchart. So now it's your turn. Here we've provided you with some of the basic symbols that are used to create a flowchart. And what we'd like you to do is using the legend is create a flowchart to represent the following process. Based on the outside temperature, choose a jacket from the following options to wear. Either no jacket, a light jacket, or a heavy jacket. So pause the webinar now and try to come up with a flowchart to represent this process. So this is a simple solution for the scenario on the last slide. Note that your flowchart may look completely different than this, but produce the same outcome, and that's totally fine. So as we walk through the sequence, we'll see that we start, we then have an input, which will be the temperature, the outside temperature, followed by the first decision, which is asking if the temperature is above 15 degrees Celsius. If the answer is yes, we don't put on a jacket. If the answer is no, we have Another condition is the temperature below negative five degrees. If the answer is yes, we put on a heavy jacket. If not, we're deciding to put on a light jacket. Now, keep in mind that this as well is quite a simple process and flowchart with few conditions. However, we can increase the complexity by adding additional conditions, such as, well, is it warm out but also raining? Are we going out to an event? or just to run an errand. So that's a way that we can see this flowchart becoming a little bit more complex. Everything that we've learned today in computational thinking can be applied to coding on the computer. Taking our computational thinking to the computer, you may have noticed that there are many different programming languages out there. They might be block-based, where you drag puzzle pieces together to build a program, or scripted, requiring coders to type the code out on the keyboard. Some popular choices in each include Scratch, Blockly, Python, C++, and JavaScript. Most programming languages are more suited to some purposes than others. For example, drawing a circle in processing is just one line of code. Doing the same thing in C++ is very difficult. Many educators start with a block-based programming language rather than a text-based one as it's viewed to be easier, especially for students who are still developing their literacy skills. However, we'd like to point out that the jump between block-based coding and text-based coding isn't that far, and you might be surprised at how well even young students are able to pick up a text-based programming language such as Python or JavaScript. You can also include hardware in your coding by using robotics such as Sphero, Arduino Kids, Easy Robots, and Lego Mindstorms. The most important idea to keep in mind here is that the computational thinking concepts and thinking processes are useful across any programming language. It's easy to Google how to write a loop in Java, but more important to use the computational thinking in order to design your program and algorithm to know exactly when you need to use a loop. So feel free to check out our additional videos on computational thinking, including a quick tips video and a few short exact instructions challenges. Thank you for joining us today. If any questions came up during your viewing of this webinar, please feel free to reach out to us. We look forward to you tuning in to our next webinar on coding.